Today, Dr. Matt Tarr is going to be talking to us about some of the research he's doing on rights of ways related to birds. Dr. Matt Tarr is an extension professor and wildlife specialist for the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, where he works in cooperation with the New Hampshire Fish and Game to deliver education and technical assistance to private landowners, communities, and, nat and natural resource professionals who are interested in improving forest and non-forest habitats for wildlife. Matt is a licensed New Hampshire forester and has worked on, in the private sector developing forest stewardship plans and administering timber harvest aimed at accomplishing multiple land stewardship goals, both on public and private lands. Matt brings his experience to the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, where over the last 15 years, he has specialized in assessing wildlife, habitat, and association, and developing methods for accomplishing habitat management objectives and establishing um, using established civil culture methods. Matt is a master bird bander, and he designs and conducts, conducts applied research focused on shrubland bird ecology, including shrub bird associations, bird responses to habitat management and non-native shrub invasion, and bird population structure and dispersal. Today, Matt will be telling us about some of his research on right-of-way habitat management and um, their effects on birds. So Matt, I am going to pass the controls over to you. Right. <clears throat> so here shortly, you should be able to um, present your slide deck. I see it. Awesome. Um, you are um, not in presentation mode, right? Okay. Um, How's that? I can see your notes um, in your oh. next slide. So if you don't want people to see that. Uh, I don't want people wanna... to see that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's see here. There we go. How about that? That looks great. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to uh, join folks here today. Uh, this is, I don't do very many uh, web-based uh, presentations, so I'm like sitting by myself all alone in my uh, in my office here, can't see anybody, so bear with me. I'm going to do the best that I can. But uh, uh, so my research, as Ashley uh, mentioned, is focused primarily on studying uh, shrubland habitats and the bird species that use shrublands for their habitat and determining how uh, site conditions such as vegetation and soils within shrublands combine with the landscape composition around shrublands influence what bird species will use different shrublands as their habitat. So, so we're all on the same page when I'm talking about shrublands. Um, I think we're all familiar by talking about habitats that are dominated by shrubs and young trees, usually less than 15 feet tall. These are usually interspersed with grasses and ferns and wildflowers, and uh, very few or no trees um, that provide shade uh, to limit uh, the shrubs and the ground cover. Um, these are often referred to as habitats, early successional habitat, scrub shrub habitat, and young forest. Collectively, these all um, are what I consider to be shrublands. So here in New, in New England, in New Hampshire, in Maine specifically, where I do most of my research, we have about 36 species of songbirds, uh, birds, mostly songbirds, uh, that require shrublands as their primary nesting habitat. And we consider these to be the shrubland dependent birds. And throughout the presentation today, I might refer to them as shrub birds or shrubland birds. And shrublands are very important for this group of bird species because the shrublands provide them with the cover that they require for nesting and for avoiding predators. They provide them with an abundance of insects and fruit that they use for raising their young and getting ready for migration. And also they include um, important sorts of structure that um, certain birds like this chestnut sided warbler uses um, as singing perches. So historically here in New England, and by historically, I mean prior to European settlement, um, we had um, natural shrublands that occurred across our landscape in a variety of different places. Um, we, these included uh, beaver wetlands and thickets on the edges of uh, wetland edges. So these are wet shrubland habitats, and uh, these wet shrublands uh, supported a slightly, a similar but slightly different suite of bird species 
than historic dry shrublands, which would occur in uh, pine, oak pine barrens um, along our coastal dunes, and then throughout the interior of New England um, as a result of periodic forest disturbances, um, primarily wind events uh, and, and fire locally. So unfortunately today, many of these natural shrublands have been lost due to a variety of different factors. Um, development is the most important one. We also have um, significantly altered, primarily reduced or, or eliminated um, natural disturbances that would have created these habitats naturally. And so in the absence of many of these disturbances, um, many, much of our forest in New England is becoming increasingly mature and no longer is in the shrubland stage. And so since about the mid-1900s, we've seen a significant decline in uh, the amount of shrubland habitats on our landscape. And so as a result of this loss of shrublands, um, as expected, we, would ex we are finding that the wildlife species and the birds in particular that require shrublands as their habitat have also been declining. And many of these species have uh, suffered precipitous declines over the last uh, 60 or so years. So what we find is that today on our landscape, most of our shrubland dependent bird species actually rely on anthropogenic or human created shrublands. And here in the area that I work, um, these human created shrublands occur as four primary uh, shrubland types in uh, shrubby old fields that are no longer being mowed or grazed, in uh, active or uh, abandoned gravel mines or sand and gravel pits, um, in, transmit, in shrubby transmission line rights of ways, uh, per, uh, especially those that are greater than about uh, 165 meters wide, and in regenerating clear cuts. And so since about 2012, I've been conducting bird research on, bird research on uh, transmission line rights of way here in New England and with the intent of trying to uh, get a better understanding for how rights of way and other human created shrublands function as habitat for birds. Um, I, my PhD work was focused on studying how uh, invasive shrubs compared to native shrubs and providing habitat for birds like this common yellowthroat that nest on rights away. Um, I'm not going to be presenting uh, this research today. However, um, I have provided Ashley with an electronic copy of this presentation, and that electronic copy actually includes an overview of that PhD research and the results um, for you to see. Um, today, I'll be focusing on two studies that we've recently completed, um, one uh, done by my graduate student, Randy Shu, studying the distribution of shrubland birds among human-created shrublands, and one that is literally hot off the presses. I just got the re results uh, this week um, from another graduate student who has been studying the use of rights away and clear cuts by both shrubland and mature forest birds. So we'll start with the first one, um, looking at the work that Randy Shu did, looking at the site-specific and landscape features um, that predict shrubland bird occurrence in anthropogenic or human-created shrublands. So although all of our shrubland birds are habitat specialists that require shrubland habitat, um, I consider these birds to occur along a gradient for how specialized or how picky they are for specific shrubland conditions. So on the most general end of the gradient are species such as common yellowthroats and song sparrows and gray catbirds that use a wide range of vegetation conditions. They occur on both wet and dry sites, and they are the least area sensitive, meaning that they, it's not uncommon for them to, to find them in habitats less than about two and a half acres or one hectare in size. Um, on the other end of this gradient are species um, including uh, brown thrashers and prairie warblers and blue-winged warblers that seem to only occur in shrublands that are composed of specific vegetation conditions. Um, these species are often absent on sites that are either too wet or too dry, and they are often absent or uncommon from shrublands less than about two hectares in size. So it is well, it's well recognized in the literature and through observation that vegetation structure and shrubland size are two very important cues that shrubland birds use for selecting their habitat. So the first objective um, of our uh, study was to determine if differences in site-specific features of shrublands influence shrubland bird distribution among the different anthropogenic shrubland types. 
So our study uh, sites differed in the uh, following ways. Um, old fields in our area are composed of a dense herbaceous layer um, that grows among shrubs uh, that vary in their height and density. Um, old fields have a large proportion of non-native shrubs. The soils are prim primarily uh, moist and they range from 1 to 22 hectares in size. Gravel pits have limited or no herb layer. There's a large amount of exposed soils. Shrubs are clumped along the edges or in scattered islands. Uh, most of the vegetation is native. Um, these sites, of course, are very dry and they're large. They range from 2 to 91 hectares in size. Um, rights away in our, um, that we use for our study were all greater than 50 meters or 165 feet wide. And they all supported an exceptionally uh, diverse uh, conditions, um, including shrubs and an herb layer that ranged from sparse to very dense. They had soils that ranged from very dry uh, to inundated. Um, most of the rights away are composed of a mixture of native and non-native shrubs. And all of the shrubs and all of the uh, rights away in this study um, here in New Hampshire are maintained by mowing. Um, with a brontosaurus style mower um, on about a three to four year cycle. And of course that tends to favor a, lar a large hardwood sapling component. Um, rights away of course are very linear and they range from uh, one to 20 hec 27 hectares in size. Our clear cuts in the study range from one to 15 years uh, following uh, being uh, harvested. Uh, they tend to be dominated by hardwood saplings and mostly native shrubs. They, they range from very dry to moist in their soils, and they range from about 1 to 24 hectares. So uh, we should also expect, in addition to the vegetation, that the composition of the landscape surrounding shrublands um, should influence which, shrubland, which shrublands that birds select as their habitat. So shrubland birds might prefer landscapes where, multi where, where multiple shrublands are clustered in close proximity to one another. And the main reason for this is that we think it actually fa facilitates their ability um, to move around, among different shrublands in order to mate with multiple partners um, and or to relocate to a new habitat if they lose an early nest due to predation. However, the big, there's a big unknown here, and that unknown is we don't really have a good handle over um, regarding the, the landscape over which um, the, the, excuse me, over the distance over which the landscape um, influences the birds. Um, when we look at the literature, the results range uh, among studies that have found uh, no clear influence of the landscape on these birds to other studies finding that birds are responding to the landscape um, from as far, as far as two and a half kilometers away. And so the second objective um, of this study was to determine the distance over which the landscape composition influenced bird distribution among our different shrubland types. So this study was conducted in southeastern New Hampshire in, Rocking, uh, in Rockingham County and Stratford County. Um, we surveyed a total of 101 shrublands that were nearly evenly distributed among the clear cuts, gravel pits, old fields, and rights of way. We studied half of these sites um, in 2015 and the other half in 2016, and all of the sites were located at least uh, a quarter of a, a kilometer away from each other. The predominant landscape in this study area is about 70% forested, 14% developed, 7% fields and pasture, and 4% dry shrublands. So for this study, we concentrated on determining the presence or absence of eight focal shrubland bird species in each study site. So we selected these uh, eight species for a few reasons. Uh, they are the most specialized shrubland birds in our study area which means that um, it is not common for them to occur in habitats other than shrublands. Um, each one of these species are identified in at least one or more of the New England states as species that are in greatest need of conservation uh, due to long-term population declines. Um, their individual habitat requirements or preferences um, combined span the range of the conditions that are required by our local shrubland bird community. And importantly for us, we rely on undergraduates to do a lot of our work, and it's relatively easy for us to train. Oops. It's relatively easy for us to train our undergraduate field technicians on how to um, accurately identify um, this limited number of birds by sight and sound. 
So we conducted three presence absence surveys in each shrubland between May and August. For each survey, we would walk the entire shrubland between sunrise and about noon. Uh, we would broadcast the calls or songs of each of the focal bird species until we identified them as present. We assume we uh, considered a species to occur at a site if it was present during at least one of our surveys, and consecutive surveys were conducted at least two weeks apart. Um, within each of our shrublands, we also estimated 12 site-specific features, um, the size, the perimeter, um, the woody plant species richness, um, and the vegetation density of all um, vegetation combined. We also estimated the percent cover of native <clears throat> shrubs and saplings, non-native shrubs, herbaceous cover, bare ground, and open water. <clears throat> Then we used ArcGIS to create six landscape buffers around each shrubland from 50 meters out to 10 kilometers. And we used uh, the land fire data later uh, to estimate the proportion of each buffer that was composed of these seven habitat types. We used a variety of st statistical methods to determine, uh, to determine if there were differences in where each focal bird species occurred among shrubland types. And then uh, we did a number of different, different modeling um, approaches to determine how site-specific features combined with landscape features to influence where birds occur. And uh, I rely very heavily on my graduate students to do that modeling work, so please don't ask me too uh, many terrible questions about that. So uh, we'll get right into uh, the results here. Uh, the first of our results will be uh, to summarize the best fit um, statistical models that predicted where birds occur. All right, so the results that are unique to our study is that the best models for every species included um, both site-specific and landscape features um, within their models. And all of the birds responded to landscape at scales ranging from 50 meters out to 10, 10 kilometers. Um, our results that are similar to what others have found is that uh, many of the bird species are responding to landscape composition at multiple scales, um, such that habitats that are important uh, nearby um, are often different than habitats that are important further away. Also, bird response to variables is species specific, such that the variables that are positively associated with one bird species um, are very often negatively associated with another bird species. And so, in other words, um, with regards to the, the vegetation conditions, um, one size does not fit all um, as far as the birds are concerned. So these slides show the proportion of the variables in our best fit models that were either site-specific features in orange or landscape features in blue. And what we find is that the best models uh, for flycatchers, thrashers, bluing warblers, field sparrows, indigo buntings, and prairie warblers contain more landscape features than site-specific features. Um, overall, the proportion of shrubland, field and pasture, and development accounted for 55% of the landscape features that continued to rise as important in our best fit models. <clears throat> this figure shows the patterns for how each of the focal bird species were responding to the proportion of either shrubland, field and pasture, or development in the surrounding landscape. Here, the length of the bar indicates the strength of the response, so longer bars mean a stronger response. Bars that are below the zero line indicate a negative response to the variable, and those above the, the zero line are positive responses. Uh, the occurrence of all of our focal bird species was positively associated with the proportion of shrubland um, and bird response to shrubland was greatest um, within about 500 meters of our shrublands. Most of our focal birds responded negatively to increasing proportions of field and pasture in the landscape. 
Um, the occurrence of blue wing warblers and chestnut sided warblers was positively associated with fields and pastures. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, this is, at least for blue wing warblers, is probably explained by the fact that they were actually most likely to occur in old fields. Um, the extent of the bird response to the field and pasture extended from 50 meters to 10 kilometers away from shrublands, and it was strongest around one kilometer. Um, all of our birds except blue-winged warblers responded negatively to increasing proportions of development in the landscape. And so we think that this positive response by blue-winged warblers is simply due to the fact that, again, blue-winged warblers occurred most frequently in old fields, and old fields in our study tended to be in landscapes with a large proportion of development. Um, overall, bird response to development was strongest around 500 meters. So we found that vegetation density in shrublands was the most important site-specific variable that predicted our focal bird occurrence. In shrublands that were composed of dense, short, and very dense vegetation, seem to support all focal species. And so I'll summarize how I describe this vegetation condition when I see it. Um, these are shrublands that are composed of dense shrubs with short and tall saplings um, that are interspersed with patches of bare ground and leaf litter and patches of herbaceous plants that range from less than to over one meter tall. Um, this vegetation condition occurred somewhere in nearly all of our uh, shrublands, and it supported all of our focal bird species. Sparse vegetation, uh, where the shrubs are short, there's a large amount of bare ground, and limited or no herb layer was positively associated with uh, brown thrasher and eastern towhee occurrence, and negatively associated with blue wing warblers and all their flycatchers. Uh, sparse conditions are most, were most common in our gravel pits. Um, all vegetation, very dense and tall, consisted of tall shrubs and saplings and a tall herb layer, um, had minimal bare ground, and was positively associated with blue wing warblers and alder flycatchers, and least preferred by brashers, prairie warblers, and field sparrows. Overall, the rights of way in our study area contain the greatest variety of vegetation conditions, and as I will show you now, our rights of way tended to uh, support the greatest uh, variety and abundance of uh, our shrubman birds. So differences in the vegetation conditions among the different shrubland types resulted in significant differences in where different focal bird species occurred. Um, so in these next slides, I will describe where each species along the bottom here um, was most likely to occur and the site-specific conditions they were most associated with. So blue bars are clear cuts, orange bars are old fields, gray bars are gravel pits, and yellow bars are rights of way. So all of our bird species except brown thrashers were detected at least once in all of our shrubland types. Thrashers were absent from clear cuts, and they were significantly more likely to occur in gravel pits or gravel mines than any other shrubland type. Um, brown thrashers are the least common and perhaps the most specialized shrubland bird in our study area. They prefer very, very dry, sandy sites that have uh, sparse shrubs and a fair amount, uh, an abundant amount of bare ground. Field sparrows, indigo buntings, and prairie warblers were significantly more likely to occur in gravel pits and rights away than in clear cuts or old fields. These species prefer habitats that have a mixture of different uh, shrubland heights, and uh, they like a present but a short herb layer. Um, in the case of the prairie warblers or field sparrows, they require very dry sandy sites. Eastern towhees were most likely to occur in rights away in gravel mines and they were significantly more likely to occur in rights away than in clear cuts in old fields. Towhees like a mixed height shrubland and a dense well interspersed uh, shrubs uh, that have an herb layer and some bare ground and leaf litter where they forage. Chestnut sided warblers were most likely to occur in rights away in clear cuts and significantly more likely to occur in rights away than in old fields or gravel pits. They like a mixed height shrubland and scattered tall saplings for singing. 
Um, alder flycatcher occur most frequently in rights away, but there is no difference among the, the different rights away types or the, the shoveling types. Blue winged warbler was the only species to occur most frequently in old fields, but the difference among site types wasn't significant, and this species prefers habitats that have a very well established grass layer interspersed with dense shrubs. So to summarize the results of this study, um, as a group, our focal birds were most likely to occur in shrublands where the landscape in the, where, where the, landscape in the surrounding 500 meters was composed of a greater proportion of shrublands and a lower proportions of fields of de in development. They were most likely to occur in shrublands greater than 12 hectares in size. Uh, and where uh, dominant vegetation conditions included a mixture of dense shrubs, short and tall saplings, with patches of bare ground or leaf litter, and patches of herbaceous plants ranging from less than to over one meter tall. Overall, rights of way and gravel pits were the largest shrublands that not only supported the greatest diversity of microhabitats or vegetation conditions, they also supported the greatest number of our focal bird species. We have reproduction data from many of our transmission line rights away in gravel pits that suggest that these habitats very likely serve as some of the largest source habitats for the shrubland birds in our landscape. And we believe that shrubby rights of way in gravel pits should really be considered potentially critical bird habitats in landscapes where large natural dry shrublands are uncommon. Okay, so we have very good data here in New Hampshire indicating how human created shrublands are used by shrubland dependent birds. However, there's still a lot of concerns that remain regarding how when we create or maintain shrublands on the landscape, how that affects birds that nest in mature forest. Um, if we are clear cutting mature forest to create shrublands, this obviously creates at least a temporary loss in nesting habitat for birds that nest in mature forests. But there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that many mature forest birds may actually use shrublands, especially after their young fledge or leave the nest. Here in New England, um, in New Hampshire, um, we have about 20 different species of songbirds that nest only in mature forest. And again, historically, shrublands have been considered almost entirely negative for, uh, for these mature forest birds. However, um, there is, uh, again, increasing evidence uh, that areas of dense shrubs are used as cover for avoiding predators by juvenile birds that haven't learned to fly yet, and by adult birds that molt their feathers after nesting and prior to fall migration. Um, shrublands are also likely a, a likely important uh, source of insects and fruits that allow young birds to grow and adults to regrow their feathers prior to migration. So as a result, having shrublands located somewhere near patches of mature forest may be important for enhancing the productivity of birds that require mature forest for nesting. So. Um, the rights away and clear cuts are the most common shrubland habitats in our study area, and there has been a fair amount of research investigating how clear cuts are used by mature forest birds, but little to no comprehensive research investigating how shrubby rights away may be used by forest birds during the breeding season. So in 2017, we commenced a two-year study to investigate the use of transmission line rights away and clear cuts by songbirds during the nesting and post nesting season. So this study objectives, uh, the objectives of this study um, were to use uh, constant effort mist netting, and I'll explain that in a second, to document the entire community of songbirds using transmission line rights away and clear cuts during the nesting and post nesting season. And then we wanted to determine how site specific features and landscape composition combined to influence the entire songbird community using these habitats. We sampled, we uh, inventoried the entire songbird community in a total of 24 transmission line rights away and 12 regenerating clear cuts. Again, all of the rights away were at least 65 meters wide and 500 meters long. Uh, the regenerating clear cuts were between zero to eight years post harvest and they ranged from four to 13 hectares. 
We separated our sites into four site management types, and the colors are coordinated to what you see on the map. Um, we had rights away that were maintained in a shrubby condition by mowing that were either zero to one years uh, after old. So these are sites that were mowed zero to one year before the study began. Uh, rights away that were mowed two to three years before the study began. Um, and these are rights away that are maintained by Eversource Energy in New Hampshire. We had eight herbicide treated rights away um, in Maine uh, by Central Maine Power. And we had a to total of 24 clear cuts. Um, we surveyed half of the sites in 2017 and half in 2018. All right, so what is constant effort mist netting? Well, mist net is a, it's just a very fine mesh net. Um, ours are 12 meters long and two and a half meters tall. And, and uh, this net is, uh, the, the mesh of this net is designed to catch birds ranging in size from hummingbirds up to blue jays. Um, constant effort means that we open the nets and just keep them open during the survey so they are catching birds passively throughout, um, throughout the day that they're opened. So our mist netting protocol, we surveyed, we did a mist net survey in each site uh, for six times between May through August, basically once every two weeks. We opened the nets for four continuous hours beginning at sunrise. And we had a group of uh, technicians that would remove birds from the nets um, every um, no more than 15 minutes. And we, capture, we standardized our capture rates among sites based on um, uh, number of birds captured per 100 net hours. So every hour that a net was opened was one net hour. In each right-of-way study site, we arranged eight mist nets um, spaced every 15 meters uh, down the length of the right-of-way, um, spaced alternately um, either on the edge or the center of the right-of-way, and all of the nets were placed perpendicular to the right-of-way edge, um, specifically so we could minimize the chances that we were capturing birds that were simply flying across the right-of-way from forest to forest. We were really trying to just capture the birds that were in the right-of-way for the right-of-way. Um, because our clear cuts are kind of odd shaped, um, we had a slightly different arrangement of our nets. Um, uh, nine mist nets were arranged in, in a total of three net lanes to best uh, position the best sample of the opening. The nets in each lane were spaced from zero, 30, and 50 meters from the edge. Zero meter nets were placed perpendicular to the edge, and the 30 and 50 meter nets were placed parallel to the edge. When birds were removed from the nets, they were all brought um, in, uh, in uh, paper lunch baggies uh, or cloth baggies to a uh, bird banding station that we, uh, a field banding station that we would erect centrally uh, to the nets that were located at each site. All birds that were captured, um, except our hummingbirds, um, were banded with a permanent uh, numbered USGS leg band, which would allow us to identify individual birds. All birds were identified to species, sex, and age using plumage, and uh, identified to their primary nesting habitat type. We considered shrub birds to be birds, uh, species that require shrubland as their primary nesting habitat, and non-shrub birds as those that use habitat other than shrublands as their primary nesting habitat. We assigned all of our birds to one of four bird categories, adult or juvenile shrub birds and adult or juvenile non-shrub birds. We compared bird capture rates to estimates of fruit abundance taken around each net. Um, immediately after miss, each mist net serving, we would count the ripe fruit um, around each net um, within, a, uh, within transects and the total number of ripe fruit tallied among all samples um, for each site was our estimate of fruit abundance at each site. We also estimated the vegetation composition, which is the proportion of herbs, native or exotic woody plants and bare ground, and the vegetation density of short, medium, or tall vegetation in a total of 50 sample points around each net. And we would average the samples um, from each net to come up with an average for each site. Finally, around each study site, we used ArcGIS. Um, learning from uh, Randy's study that I spoke about earlier, we reduced our buffer distances from 100, uh, 250, 500, and 1 kilometer. And within each of those distances, 
um, estimated the proportion of these 11 land cover types. We used uh, a variety of uh, methods to uh, compare vegetation conditions among the different site management types and to compare uh, the differences in average uh, abundance and species richness of each of the bird categories among the different management types. And we used a pretty complex, or I should say my graduate student used a pretty complex um, uh, modeling method to determine how site-specific features and landscape features combine to influence the abundance and, and richness of each bird category. All right, so our results. Um, over the course of two years, we captured uh, about uh, 5,760 individual birds represented by 78 bird species. Very interestingly, um, 40, we, we captured 49 non-shrub bird species and 25 shrub bird species. So um, our immediate conclusion here is that the bird community within the rights away in clear cuts is actually composed by a greater number of species that use non-shrubland habitats as their primary nesting habitat than by the shrubland dependent birds. Um, however, as we would expect, because uh, the shrubland birds are breeding, they're nesting in the shrublands, shrub birds, both adults and juveniles, were significantly more abundant than the non-shrub birds. So we, caught, we captured more non-shrub bird species, but we captured more individual shrub birds. The most common or abundant species that we caught, which is typical, is for common yellow throats, gray catbirds, songbirds, and prairie warblers. All of these species were caught at least 33 of our 36 sites. And common yellow throats, probably the most general of this group, was the only species caught at all sites. This suggests that certain shrubland species um, should be expected to occur in most large shrublands, somewhat independent of the vegetation and surrounding landscape composition. Comparatively, we caught 18 species at only one of our 36 sites. Um, so uh, these are birds that um, they didn't all occur at one site. Um, just throughout our 36 sites, these are the black-throated blues and brown thrashers and Carolina wrens and house sparrows were species that we only caught at one site. And so the results of this suggest that within this overall bird community, there will be species that require certain site-specific or landscape conditions that only occur at certain sites. So this is the uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling models, which basically um, provide a visual, visual representation for how similar different, uh, the different site management types are. So um, what we see here is that there is a lot of overlap in the vegetation composition and structure among our site management types. Um, you can see the biggest polygon here, which is kind of in that pink, salmon or pink color, is the uh, clear cuts. And so this shows us that the, the most variability in vegetation conditions occurred among our clear cuts. Um, overall, this, these are ANOVAs, just looking at short woody vegetation and non, uh, and short, excuse me, short, short non woody vegetation and mid height non woody vegetation among the sites. There was no significant differences in herbaceous plant structure among our uh, site management types. Herbaceous cover was pretty similar throughout. We found that the density of short uh, woody vegetation was greatest in our herbicide treated rights of way. The density of medium height woody vegetation was the least in our zero to one year old rights of way and our herbicide treated rights of way and the density of tall woody vegetation was greatest in two, and a, two to three year old rights of way and in clear cuts. Herbicide rights of way, treated rights of way had, the, had a significantly greater uh, fruit abundance than all of the other um, site management types and there was no difference among the other site management types. All right, so let's look at bird species. This is the, uh, the adult, uh, these are all of our birds, um, all birds combined. Overall, and this is species richness, so the number of species. So there was no significant difference in species richness or the number of species for any of our bird categories among our site management types. However, there were a few slight trends. 
um, the, the species richness of all of the adult birds, so of the shrub adult birds and the non-shrub adult birds, tended to be lowest in the zero to one year old rights away, where vegetation was the sparsest and the shortest. Um, adult shrub bird richness uh, tended to be highest in the two to three year old rights away. So this is agreeing with Randy Shue's uh, research that I spoke about earlier. So this, this is just looking at the abundance of our shrub birds. Um, so the abundance of both adult and juvenile shrubland birds tended to be greatest in the two to three year old rights away and the herbicide treated rights away and lowest in the one, zero to one year old rights away and in the clear cuts. This is looking at the abundance of the non-shrub birds. Both the adult and juvenile non-shrub birds were, tended to be least abundant in the zero to one year old rights away. Adults um, were more abundant in two to three year old rights away than in uh, younger rights away. And juveniles tended to be more abundant in clear cuts than in the youngest rights of way. So now we're going to look at the results of our modeling um, for how site specific and landscape burials influence the shrub birds. So our, all of our best models included both site specific and landscape variables. And so shrubland bird occurrence, we're learning, it can be best, is, at least in this study, was best predicted by a combination of vegetation conditions within a shrubland as well as a landscape composition surrounding a shrubland. So now we're going to look just at the shrub birds and the specific site-specific variables that were most important. Um, the adult and juvenile shrub birds were associated positively with the density of woody vegetation and shrub species diversity. We find um, in this study and really all of the work that we're doing on rights away and clear cut here in, in this area that we tend to find the greatest abundance and richness of our shrubland birds in shrublands that are dominated by a mixture of tall and dense native and non-native shrubs. We actually find the greatest diversity of our shrubland birds in shrublands in rights away um, that are composed by a combination of native and na non-native shrubs. Our adult and juvenile shrub birds were associated negatively with bare ground. And so what we're finding, um, so this is a little different from what we found in Randy's study and the, and the difference is due to the fact that in this study here that I'm showing you, we're looking at a greater variety of bird species. And so as a general rule, most shrub bird species are less abundant in shrublands that have a large proportion of bare ground. However, there are certain species like thrashers that may prefer or require shrublands that have a large proportion of bare ground. Adult shrub birds were also positively associated with the density of non-woody vegetation and with fruit abundance. So this may reflect that uh, many of the shrubland birds actually prefer to nest on or near the ground in dense herbaceous cover. And the response to fruit abundance may suggest that adult birds were most attracted to nets that were located where fruits were abundant. So looking at the landscape variables that were important for the shrubland birds, we find as a general rule that the landscape composition within about a quarter of a kilometer around a shrubland appears especially important for influencing the shrublands that shrub birds select as their habitat. So as a group, we found that the shrubland birds in this study were associated positively with the percentage of shrubland and the percentage of grassland within 250 meters. And they had mixed, um, uh, mixed associations with different forest types and the percentage of development within the landscape. And so these differences are, um, these results are slightly different than the study that I showed earlier. And again, it's the result of uh, studying slightly different suites of birds. Randy Shoes, the earlier study, um, was looking at a 
at eight very shrubland specialist bird species that tended to be negatively associated with grassland and development. This study here that Erica did, uh, because she was looking at a wider variety of uh, shrubland birds, including some very um, generalist species, um, we actually find that many of our less general shrubland species are often associated with, shrub with uh, edges of fields and often uh, shrubs in residential development. Overall, all shrub birds were associated negatively with habitat diversity within 500 meters surrounding shrubland habitats. Um, this result uh, agrees with what um, other research has shown, and it suggests that most of our shrubland birds um, probably prefer landscapes where shrublands are actually surrounded by other shrublands. Perhaps for some species, maybe other grasslands as well. So they probably are preferring to settle and breed in a shrubland that's surrounded by other shrublands rather than a shrubland that's surrounded by development or surrounded by mature forest. We'll look at the, the modeling results for the non-shrub birds and specifically the site-specific variables. Um, it was the density of woody vegetation in the shrublands which, that was the only site-specific variable that predicted non-shrub bird occurrence in the shrublands. And non-shrub birds were associated positively with the density of woody vegetation. This suggests that we can make shrublands more attractive or more beneficial to those mature forest or non-shrub birds by allowing the shrubs to grow tall and dense within those shrublands. So in the case of right-of-way, in our rights-of-way that were mowed, um, we would expect that rights-of-way just prior to being mowed would support the greatest um, abundance and, and diversity of non-shrub birds and clear cuts that were greater than um, three to 10, or, or between three to 10 years old. So obviously in rights-of-way, we're not gonna allow the vegetation to get super tall because we have restrictions about that. But what it suggests is, is that in the other uh, shrublands in the landscape where we can allow vegetation to get tall, it would probably be a good thing to do so if we want to make them most beneficial for the non-shrub birds. Landscape composition um, within 500 meters surrounding a shrubland appears to be especially important for influencing what non-shrub birds will occur there. Um, I literally got these results yesterday, uh, so I threw them together and I haven't really had a chance to look at them very carefully, but as we would expect, um, we've got, uh, it's kind of confusing. We've got uh, uh, things that are seeming to uh, contradict one another, and, um, but ultimately what we find is that um, that landscape um, within about 500 meters seems to be having an influence in which um, non-shrub birds show up in the landscape. Also, it seems to be that shrublands that are situated in a, in a where landscape diversity is high in the surrounding one kilometer are most likely to be used by the greatest abundance and number of juvenile non-shrub birds. So what this suggests is, is that Diverse landscapes uh, support a greater diversity of young birds that are in the neighborhood and have the potential to actually come and use um, a shrubland that's located in that neighborhood. All right, so to kind of provide a bit of a summary for these two studies, you know, we find that, again, spe bird species specific requirements for specific microhabitats, so for differences in some like tall or uh, short or tall shrubs. Others, you know, some like sparse, some like dense shrubs. You know, sparse versus dense or tall versus short herbs. Um, differences in the amount of bare ground, whether the ground's wet or dry, you know, all result in um, requiring us to maintain a landscape that has a variety of different shrubland types in it if we want those landscapes to support the greatest diversity of shrubland bird species. Although, um, although any one of these uh, uh, openings often supports a diversity of birds, uh, not all birds occur um, in the same abundance in, in each site. And so if we want to support the greatest diversity of birds, we need to support uh, we need to maintain a diversity of shrubland habitat types on the landscape. 
With regards to rights of way, you know, rights of way are obviously quite common in most of our landscapes today. And so um, our results agree with basically all of the results that are looking at how birds use rights of way and show that shrub dominated rights of way that are, um, that are wide, usually those at least 50 meters wide, should be expected to provide important habitat for shrub birds. And our research here is suggesting that those rights of way are probably also important for non shrub birds. Um, rights of way that are maintained by mowing may very likely support slightly different bird communities than those that are maintained by selective herbicide treatment, um, but the differences aren't really that significant, and having some of both on the landscape would be the, the most ideal. Recommendations for working within, with vegetation within the rights of way to maintain them as the best bird habitat. You know, very, very typical one is to only cut or spray vegetation that's capable of growing tall enough to intercept the transmission lines. So anytime that we can maintain a stable shrub cover within these rights of way, maintain a, a good dense cover of vegetation that will never grow tall enough to intercept the lines, that's the easiest way for us um, to uh, maintain bird habitat within those rights of way. And of course, obviously, we're all working under very specific regulations for how vegetation needs to be managed, but look for opportunities or consider options where slightly taller vegetation um, could be maintained perhaps away from the, the sag lines and perhaps along the rights of way edges. Finally, last slide. I truly, through my research, consider rights of way to really be the backbone of shrubland habitat management for uh, birds in many of our developed landscapes today. Um, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to come to the conclusion, well, maybe not everybody agrees with me, that in, ha in landscapes where mature forest is already very heavily fragmented, um, we may not necessarily need to cut mature forest to make shrublands if that landscape um, already has wide shrubby rights of way present. We need more work on this, but those rights of way may provide the function. Um, whenever possible, we try to cluster um, new shrublands that we make um, as close to shrubby uh, rights of way as we possibly can um, to allow animals, um, birds, and we also find um, when we put radio collars on our endangered New England cottontails, they regularly use shrubby rights away to move among the habitat patches that we create. So this project was had a, a variety of funders, um, worked very closely with both Eversource Energy and Central Maine Power, um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. A lot of the funding um, came from NRCS, Fish and Game, um, Eversource through uh, a grant that we received from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, um, not all ornithological cub, cl uh, club, and uh, we've received some funding from the Avian Powerline Interaction Committee. And so with that, um, I'll try to, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that folks might have. Matt, thank you so much. That yeah, sure. Super exciting projects, a wealth of information you threw at us. So please, you guys, we have a few minutes for questions. So please, ask questions, ask away. So let's see, are, are questions gonna come by the phone, Ashley, or by, I think I might've just see, saw a text come in. Oh, yes, people should be able to um, speak and ask questions over the phone, but if they can't, I think there's also a chat box. But yeah, I don't not. see anything on my computer. Okay, Are there any just, questions out there? So I had a question about yeah. the herbicide treatment and you seen more fruiting um, and that and the rights of ways that were managed with herbicides. Yeah. Why do you, what's the mechanism driving that? I think what it is is um, what we see in our in the herbicide treated rights away is that they tend to um, you know the the herbicide is used to specifically selectively treat the the hardwood stump sprouts and so mm -hmm. what I think what ends up happening is that 
the shrub composition, when, you, when we walk into an herbicide treated right away, they are noticeably shorter. They're denser and they're shorter than our mowed rights away. And I think what ends up happening um, is probably a combination of things. Um, uh, taking out the hardwoods allows the shrubs to grow, the fruiting shrubs to not only grow denser, but it reduces their, the shading on them. And so I think they have more energy um, to mm -hmm. be able produce good fruits when all of the uh, factors align for that. Okay. Yeah, I thought that yeah. as you were talking, I was like, huh, that was a really interesting result. Yep. Um, I was also kind of, you know, you talked a little bit about management recommendations at the end. In the second sure. study, you, you know, had a couple different um, rights of ways that had been mowed at different times, and it suggested mm -hmm. yep the more time in between a mowing event um, seemed to be in general beneficial. You were seeing fewer bird abundance and richness in the rights of ways that had just recently been mowed. And I wondered right. if you had any thoughts or recommendations on that kind of mowing frequency uh, for a right of way. Yep. So I can only speak to the rights of way that I work in and, and what I see here in New Hampshire, but um, you know, you know, I don't do this work directly. I just, you know, mm -hmm. coordinate with the arborists that do for, for Eversource. And um, it, the vast majority of the rights of way that we have here in New Hampshire can't be allowed to go unmowed more than three to four years, um, primarily because the, they are, they've been, mow, they've been uh, maintained by mowing for probably over 20 years. And so as a result, they, are, they tend to be dominated by hardwood stump sprouts. And many of those include aspen and birch, which grow ridiculously mm -hmm. fast. Okay. And so we see, we see significant differences. Um, we've done lots of different surveys of birds on these rights away. And, you uh -huh. know, the year after mowing, it's pretty depauperate. You know, there are bird species there, but, you know, that year just before it gets mowed, I mean, it is jammed with birds, lots of diversity, big abundance. And um, so it really fluctuates widely. So, you know, my, I guess the recommendations I would have for your folks were, you know, to, you know, obviously we're all working under the, you know, the right regulations that are saying, you know, what we have to do for vegetation, but look for opportunities to, you know, not cut vegetation that isn't ever going to grow tall enough um, to intercept the rights away, uh, the, um, the, the lines. That's, sure. that's a, probably the, the most logical thing that we can do for birds. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we're, does anyone else have a question? We're just, almost just out of time. Just a real quick one. Uh, this is John Acklin with EFRI, and oh, man, did I enjoy that presentation. Now, that, that was, All right, right on. That was just really fascinating. And I wondered if you had seen any kind of drop-off in, in, in your herbicide-treated right-of-ways, because the idea of, of, of uh, what we call integrated vegetation management is you only are, are treating uh, those, like you were saying, the tall-growing, uh, woody yep. species, and and you know, so wondered if you have have observed a fall off in in either species richness or abundance um, following an herbicide treatment cycle, or or have you looked at that in spe uh, specifically? So that's a great question. I I haven't had the opportunity to follow. Um, to follow those herbicide treated rights away through their entire cycle. They're a little out of the area that we normally study. We wanted to pull them in uh, to do some comparisons with veg and birds for this study. Um, you know, my, my thought is that um, I would not expect a, a real difference um, in the birds, you know, with that, with that treatment, primarily because, you know, what at least my impression of those sites looking at them is that they're pretty stable, you know. They, yeah. the, the vegetation conditions don't change that dramatically from what I see. And that, I mean, and, and so as a result, um, we would expect that the bird community is probably pretty stable. So, you know, it's, I haven't had the opportunity to do any long-term reproductive studies um, in the herbicide treated rights away or to look at, um, look at uh, demographics and the ages of the birds. Um, oftentimes what we find is what we would expect based on some work that's coming out of University of, of Mass is that sites that have been just cut uh, are probably uh, occupied primarily by one-year-old birds. Um, mm -hmm. They're occupied by the young birds that can't 
for better habitat. And then as that as those sites um, grow and they get older, you know, um, they become more they become better habitat. And so as a result, um, then there's more competition by older, more dominant birds to move in there. So it'd be neat to, to look at some of those demographics in a in um, compare them to between mowing and uh, herbicide rights away, where there is differences in how stable the shrub community is and the mm -hmm. shrub structure specifically. Right. Thanks. Yeah, for okay. sure. It's all fascinating. Right on. Yeah, okay. I'm happy I to really, answer. I, yeah. Emails yeah. or whatnot, I'm very happy to answer any questions folks have. Oh, uh, sure. Appreciate that. Great. Right well, Matt, I don't want to keep you past our time. I do have two more questions, so I'll have to email You're not keeping me, so I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to <laughs> chat with folks. And, and actually, I just want to reiterate to, to folks and, and to you as well, you know, please feel free to share uh, the, that, the presentation I gave today. Okay. It also has, Great. It also has the information from um, the native exotic uh, shrub study. Yep, I'm okay. happy to try. I'm happy to stay on the line if folks have more okay. questions. Okay, great, great. Well, then I'll ask my question. So I was curious sure. about. So you showed an in NDS um, ordination for vegetation yep. cover across, and I was wondering if you also did an NDS analysis for your bird communities across the four different treatment. I, th I think it was four treatments you were looking at in that study. I was wondering if there was differences in bird community composition across treatments. Uh, boy, I've looked at so much data from my graduate student recently trying to figure <laughs> out what's going in and out of her thesis. I'm not sure. That's a great question, though. But my general, um, I don't know. That's my, that's the easy answer to that question. Okay. Um, I okay. think so, but but I think the general the general pattern that we're seeing from the the data is suggesting that there isn't real significant differences in the bird community overall. You know, species okay. here or there, you know, might be more likely, but that's a great question. That's something that obviously we should look at more more carefully if it hasn't been done. Okay, and then um, so my background is in pollinators, and I like to think about how potentially pollinators might be using rights of ways for dispersal across the landscape. And you talked yeah. a little bit about that, I think, um, you know, looking at the surrounding landscape and looking at potentially, I think, for your mature um, non I'm, I'm getting um, your term wrong, yeah. non-shrubby yeah. birds and how yeah. they potentially liked having um, habitat closer together, clustered. So I was wondering if you'd done any studies actually thinking or looking at the use of rights of ways to facilitate bird dispersal across the landscape. Yeah, that's great. So, man, bird dispersal for birds of, of, of the songbird size is still really difficult to study because they're too small to put um, strong radio transmitters on. So once they leave, we can track them within a shrubland, but it's difficult after. However, the way that we've gone about that, actually Randy Shu, before he started his graduate project, we did a, a study with NRCS, where over the course of, a, of a three years, um, actually including Erica's study too, um, we, we put colored leg bands on almost 800 prairie warblers in this landscape. Oh my gosh. And wow. through, um, through a combination of, um, of uh, the mist netting work that Erica was doing and then uh -huh. hiring hiring students to go to every shrubland where you think there may be a bird, we have really good movement data on prairie warblers, some on field sparrows, and um, some towhees. And so what we okay. find is that most, most of the birds would, so it's not uncommon for birds to use multiple shrublands. Most of the birds stay within the same shrubland throughout the breeding season, but many okay. of the birds move. We, that, of the birds that were found in more than one shrubland within a growing season or within mm -hmm. a breeding season, the average movement was six and a half kilometers. Okay. So again, the vast majority of birds were always found in the same shrubland, but those birds that we were lucky enough to relocate in another opening, the average distance that they moved was six and a half kilometers. Wow. We have we have some birds that have moved over 30 kilometers, including one bird that was captured one day um, in southern New Hampshire. I captured that bird the next day 30 kilometers away. Oh and, the, and, and the following day, it was captured again at the site that it was originally captured at. So, oh, wow. Wow. So That's we, fascinating. We, 
We've also collected um, blood from all of those birds. So we've got blood from birds. Um, we've analyzed DNA relatedness of birds from central New Hampshire all the way up to Wells, Maine, you know, so it's a big landscape mm -hmm. and they're all related. So they all are functioning as one big, there's no genetic, there's no population difference um, genetically among oh. them. So okay. basically um, those prairie warblers are kind of functioning as one, one big population, the extent yep. of which we do not know. So okay. we, um, we're working with UMass Amherst and folks out in Albany, New York, and we've just got some blood from, from their birds. And so we've got students that are currently working on that. So the bottom line is, is that these birds just flew 2,000 miles to get here, so flying across town isn't a problem. Right. <laughs> and, 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 through the, and through one of the other things that we know so little about is where do the young birds go? So mm -hmm. the, the adults are very, have very strong site fidelity to uh, a site once they breed there. Usually over half of the breeding males come back to the same site every year, but they're wow. young disperse and we don't know where they go. But the, re the literature suggests that some of these birds could be dispersing over a hundred kilometers. And so, wow. I, so the take home message for that for me is, is that I, probably populations of some of these species are functioning over a significantly larger landscape than we have ever given them credit for. Mm -hmm. Wow. But, but our research suggests, the, re the research that I just showed you suggests yeah. that local landscape conditions seem to matter. That, right. um, you know, our research and, and that coming out of uh, UMass um, shows pretty strongly that, you know, these shrubland birds seem to prefer to select shrublands that are surrounded by other shrublands. And so, um, so we need more work with regards to how the shrublands are located in positions to the mature forest conditions, mm -hmm. but um, they, landscape matters, yep. Right. So are, are there, I see there's still a few people on the line. Does anyone else on the line have any more questions? Uh, yeah, Ashley, this is Lou Payne from the New York Power Authority. I do have a question. Sure, Lou, sure. go ahead. Um, Matt, great presentation. Very much enjoyed it. Um, great. The question I have for you is, as these shrubland sites become better, what's the competition like among the species or among the same species of birds? Does it get much more fierce? That's a great question. I think, I think what ends up, I, I think um, based on my, so my, my direct, um, the bulk of my uh, experience, like really following birds in that pattern is with common yellow throats. And what, what we find is that, you know, right after mowing, that year after mowing where there's not a lot of shrubs, <clears throat> there's a limited number of birds there. Their territories are big. They often span the entire right of way. But, you know, the, by, the, by the next growing season or the third growing season, that vegetation is so dense and so tall the birds don't need to have big territories to meet their needs. So I think what ends up happening within species is that they just, you know, these birds are really good at, at partitioning resources. And so, you know, they want to minimize competition whenever possible. They're only going to defend territories that are as large as they need them to be. And so I think the veg, my gut tells me that the, that as the vegetation gets denser within a species, they kind of sort it out among themselves. However, there may be, Although there are more individuals coming into those sites, I think the sites have a greater ability to support those individuals. Mm -hmm. with, with regards to competition among species, um, the, again, these birds are really good at uh, fine differences in where they make their nests and where they find food. And, and I mean, that's just, that's just niche partitioning evolution stuff that allows multiple birds of different species to co-occur without out-competing one another. So yes, there is obviously some competition. Probably that competition is, is fiercest in years where um, caterpillar production is low um, due to weather events, because caterpillars, caterpillars are the reason why these birds are coming to New England to breed, uh, because caterpillars are the, the most important food that they're feeding to their nestlings. And so if, if 
weather conditions influence food availability, then that is probably the conditions where we would see direct competition between individual birds. But they still do a really good job of, hey, I'm for, I mean, they don't, I don't think they get together to, to sort this out, but uh, hey, I'm foraging on the ground, hey, I'm foraging in the leaves, hey, I'm foraging in the bare ground, I'm up in the tall shrubs, I'm down in the low shrubs. I avoid invasive plants. I don't care about invasive plants. You know, all of that stuff happens. And so I think that minimizes the direct competition between species. All right. Are there any last minute questions before I thank Matt? Cool. I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all. And again, please, uh, my email is on that um, presentation. Uh, if you look through, if you have any questions about that or have any other questions, uh, I would I welcome those. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. What a great yeah, sure. set of research that you have um, generated out of your lab. Really impressive. And again, just thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ashley. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. All Thanks, right. Guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>